Hello, first graders. It is wonderful to be here today. My name is Mrs. S, and we are going to take you on a nature walk today. And I'm Mr. Roth. I'm a seventh grade science teacher over across the street at the middle school. And we're looking forward to walking through the nature trail with you today and showing you a few different highlights of our nature trail that we're so fortunate to have right here in our backyard at Southern Columbia. And before we go, I wanna show you what I usually take with me when I go on a nature walk. I have my backpack. It says Eve, because this used to be my daughter's. But anyway, I take my binoculars and I take, sometimes I take a magnifying glass because sometimes things are very small and I can't see exactly what they are. So I take my little magnifying glass. I also take along some field guides because sometimes I don't know, well, most of the time, I don't know what those things are. So something like butterflies or an insect guide or the trees, the common trees of Pennsylvania, I might take along with me. But the best thing I take with me is my nature journal because I can't remember everything I see. And most of the time I can't remember exactly what it looks like. And so I take my nature journal and I take some colored pencils so that when I find something that I can't, that I don't know what it is and it's not in my guide, I can draw it. Let me show you. Now listen, art was not my major. So, so like I would draw little pictures like this to try to figure out what things are when I get back home to my other guides. And I also write, you know, a story or a narrative about what I saw. So that's something that you can do at home. I heard that you have a writing journal um, that you used to write in. And so that would be perfect if you still have that. You can write in your, your writing journal about the things that you see when you go for a walk, okay? The other thing that I take with me when I go for a walk are my senses. My eyes, my ears, my nose. Well, I don't taste things, that wouldn't be good. But sometimes you can feel things and feel how soft they are. So I take my senses with me and I look high up into the trees and I look down in the tiny little things that are on the ground too. So that's what we're gonna, um, that's what I would normally take with me. I'm not taking all that stuff today because we're just going for a little short walk. But just so you know, when you go for a walk, those are the kinds of things that you can take, okay? Anything else to add, Mr. Roth? Yeah, I'll just explain to you real quick the, the nature bingo process that you all at home can go through. You have this sheet of paper um, on your computers or maybe printed out and it has the following boxes on it. Something smelly, animal track, flower, something green, something that doesn't belong, fungus, animal home, interesting rock, a seedling, which is a baby tree, a seed, something smooth, insect, beaver or animal sign, plant, feather, and water. So throughout this walk, and you can utilize your pause button too when you're watching this video. If you need time to write or draw, you can draw a picture of something that fits in one of these boxes. You could just put an X or you can write, whichever you choose. Are you ready to get started? I think so. All right, let's head into the trail. Look, Mr. Roth, look at this. Do you see this log right here? I think that somebody has been trying to eat in that log. What do you think? I believe so. I think something was probably after some insects uh, that like to live in these old caverns inside dead rotting trees. Yeah. What do you think it could have been, Mrs. S? Well, I know that bears like to eat insects and so do, let's see, um, oh, squ not squirrels. What am I trying to say? Um, like possums maybe or yeah. um, raccoons. Yeah, yeah it's, it's hard to say yeah. without seeing any tracks or any scat here, who is the particular culprit for this. But like Mrs. S said, bears love to tear apart rocks, rocks like this and look for insects, as well as all of our meso mammals, which are our medium sized mammals like skunks and possums and raccoons. So there's various critters that could have done this, but nonetheless, they were digging in this dead stump looking for a little snack. Yeah. All right, hey first grade, we found something pretty interesting here off the side of the trail as soon as we crossed the bridge. Mrs. S, what do you think we have here? Wow, oh, well, it looks like a skull because there are some eye sockets and there are some teeth. 
and it's pretty big, so it's not a squirrel. And you look at these teeth. They don't look like something that would tear up things apart. They look like they might be like molars or grind stuff. So, I don't know. Maybe it's a deer. What do you think? I think you're right. I think that definitely is a deer skull. And it looks like a relatively young deer skull too. And like Mrs. S said, uh, the teeth are a good giveaway here. They're molars and they're used for grinding up things like maybe acorns or grasses or seeds. And by the shape and structure of the skull, you know, being regular residents of the Pennsylvania woods, we all, we all have an idea of what a deer skull looks like. And that is in fact what this is. So. It looks like a young, a young deer may have died here um, in previous months or maybe even longer than that ago. And these are the remains that are left. A lot of the remains uh, get scarfed up pretty quickly. Uh, the organs, the hide, a lot of the meat. Uh, critters will eat that away from the bones real quick. And then even the bones will get chewed up uh, by certain organisms. And then they'll, it'll all eventually break down um, and return back to the soil here uh, to the earth. Cool. cool. Okay, first graders, did you know that spring is my favorite season? And do you know why it's my favorite season? Well, first of all, because it gets warm, but also because in the woods, um, if you um, look up, you'll notice that there's no, there aren't too many leaves coming out on the trees, and that allows the sunshine to shine down on the forest floor. And when that happens, we get lots of wildflowers and like you can see right here we have a whole lot of well first of all this is these are they look like umbrellas right but this is a may apple and if you look under you see the bud of the may app the mayflower it's um it will get white and then it will get a little a uh, little berry on it that the wildlife love and then here we have a spring beauty that little flower right there, isn't that pretty? Now they close up when they're too cold and they were all closed up this morning when I came down, but now it's nice and warm. So they're out and enjoying the sun, the warmth. And then over here we have a little violet and right next to it, there is a little tree seedling right there. I think it's a birch, but I'm not positive. But yeah, so when you go out in the woods in the spring, look around on the, on the forest floor and you will see tons of little wildflowers, okay? All right, well, keep moving. All right, first grade. So this is a part in the trail where I always like to sneak up. And the reason I like to sneak up is because this is a vernal pool. And vernal pools are home to a lot of our amphibians down here at the Nature Trail. Specifically right now, green frogs, which you're gonna learn about with Mrs. Williams today. Earlier in the year, there were some wood frogs here, but all of these frogs like to hop away from people. And if they see much movement, they'll hop away sooner. So I always try to creep up to the edge here to see if we can catch a peek of some frogs before they jump into the water. So we'll creep up here and maybe zoom in on the, on the vernal pool and see if we can find any. Ooh. Oh, right there's one. I got him. Oh, yeah. There's actually another one up above, too. I'm not sure which one you're on. But there's one here, and then there's one in, like, the exact same position, eight feet in front of it. Those are big green frogs. Where's the other one at? Eight feet ahead of it in literally, like, the exact same position. Same spot in the glare up there facing dead away from us. Oh, I see him. So this is one of our vernal pools that we have here at the Nature Trail. Um, there's a few more, one that we walked by on the way in and a couple more that we'll walk by near the end of the trail. But vernal pools have a very important role in our ecosystems, particularly for amphibians. The reason why has to do actually with their name. Vernal means of the spring or in the spring. And these pools will fill up with water in the springtime, but there's a chance that they could dry up come the end of the summer or fall or winter, and that's actually why they are so important. Because they can dry up, 
there's no fish that are going to live in these vernal pools. And fish are the number one predator of amphibian eggs. So because this pool can dry up, hence the name vernal pool, and it typically only has water in it in the spring, our amphibians are safer to breed here and lay their eggs here um, because their amphibian eggs are a very easy to get tasty treat for fish. And I think Mrs. S is actually gonna tell us about uh, another, a cool plant that we have scattered all over this bank across from this vernal pool. This is another one of those flowers that only shows up in spring. Um, but we missed its blooming time. But if you look down here, do you see all these little leaves? Like right here, those are all the leaves of a flower we call a trout lily. We call it a trout lily because it blooms usually around the first day of trout. Um, if you look closely at the leaves, you can see that they have a couple of different color greens going on. We call that mottled. And the cool thing about these is that they only bloom when they're about five years old. And so when they were in bloom, not all of these had flowers. They have to, the, the young ones have to get older so they can have a flower. So when you see these out and about, even those are really pretty. They're a pretty yellow and they kind of look upside down. Uh, don't pick them, okay? Okay. Let's see what else we can find, all right, first graders? Oh, I can't wait to talk about the skunk cabbage, Mr. Roth. But we, oh, look, look what we found. Oh my, it's a deer ant. Aren't they supposed to be on the deer? <laughs> so first grade, this is a great time for us to talk about an antler and what differentiates an antler from a horn. See, these deer antlers actually fall off or shed every single year. So if there's any of you out there who are deer hunters, or maybe you know somebody who's a deer hunter, um, these antlers fall off typically around February or March, uh, depending on the individual and kind of depending on the weather sometimes as well. And they regrow throughout the entire spring and summer to form those big, beautiful antlers that you see in the fall when it comes time for hunting season. Horns, however, do not shed every year. Horns stay with animals for their entire lives. Um, and there's a permanent bone structure underneath, typically a hair-like sheath, when we're talking about horns on things like goats or antelope. Um, and this deer antler that Mrs. S spotted is actually right along one of our best deer trails that we have down here at the Nature Trail. And this is a great spot to go down and kind of look in the mud and see if there's any tracks of animals that may have crossed the creek right here. So let's head down there and see if we can find any tracks and then we'll come back up and Mrs. S is gonna to talk to you about this big leafy plant that you see behind us. Aha, and sure enough, as there always is here at this spot, there are some deer tracks. So this here is a deer track. Uh, you can see where the hoof of the deer was coming in this direction. Uh, this deer here was going in that direction. They both look like they're like average size doe tracks. Um, too big to be fawns and not quite big enough or with pronounced dew claws in the back to be a mature buck. Uh, so that looks like it was probably a few doe that traveled through here pretty recently. Let's talk about this plant that we see all in here where it's nice and wet and moist. This plant, if you touch it and, and disturb it and crumple it up, is gonna smell bad. And so that's why it has the name that it has. It's called a skunk cabbage. And it gets these giant leaves on it and um, you would think that it would be in flower now because of all, you know we have so many other flowers right now. But this plant is special. This is the first plant that flowers in this, well, late winter. It will actually flower in late February or early March. It has a special quality called thermogenesis. I know that's a big word, but it means that it creates its own heat. And so when it's time to flower, that flower will melt its way up through the snow and frozen ground. No leaves yet, just the flower. And it looks like um, a hood and it's a maroon and green flower. And it's, it's really pretty for a, a, for a plant that doesn't smell very good. And in fact, that flower also stinks. And so what do you think, first graders, would 
be attracted to, what insect would be attracted to something that smells bad? And no, not, um, not a stink bug. No, no, a, a fly. Right, there's a special fly that comes out at the same time the skunk cabbage blooms that is attracted to the skunk cabbage flower because it smells bad and the fly likes smelly things, right? Right, so this is a cool, cool plant. No other plant that I know of has that particular quality that it can melt its way through the snow. I happen to have with me a first grader that you probably know and he would like to try to smell this skunk cabbage. What do you think? Come on over. So I'll let you break a piece off. Give it a smell. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> so it's aptly named, yes. <laughs> We're heading into our first patch of hemlock trees and we have a few of these different patches of hemlocks scattered throughout the nature trail. They're a great place to catch some shade and maybe have a, have a picnic or read a book. It stays a lot cooler underneath the canopy of hemlocks. And a hemlock is actually the state tree here in Pennsylvania. And I'll pull one of these branches down so you can see what its leaves or needles look like. It's a coniferous tree and it keeps its leaves or needles all year round. And you can see up here a little cone that it has. For such a big tree, it has such a tiny cone. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, and they grow very, very tall, and they typically grow in clusters like this. Now, they are at danger of something called blight, um, which has affected hemlock trees across the state. These ones look pretty healthy, um, comparative to some. We did lose a lot of our hemlock population uh, in recent years, though, due to that blight. Well, we're coming up on the creek here. I can hear the water running. It's the rare and dangerous Labra Bear. I wonder if I can sneak up on it so I can show it to you. Shh. This is not really a labra bear. This is just my, well, a stuffed animal that I have at my house. But I thought we'd find something that doesn't belong so that you could put that on your bingo. How's that, okay? Um, and as I was sneaking up on the labra bear, I found something else that doesn't belong here. Somebody left their fishing line um, down here, which is, that's litter and we don't want to keep that we don't want that to be down here so I'm going to pick that up probably just maybe put it in my pocket or something uh, maybe I'll put it with the labra bear so I can come back and get it later so something that doesn't belong we found two more things that don't belong except they are plants but they don't belong in Pennsylvania or even in the United States the first one is this one right here this is called garlic mustard and it's a, it's a pretty little flower and everything, but it, what, what makes it invasive is that it will take over and push out the native plants and not give them a chance to grow. So that's one of them. And then the other one, you wanna talk about that one? Mr. Sure, Lee? yeah. The other that we have here is a very easy to identify plant called Japanese knotweed. And there's a little bit more of it down here than usual. I typically bring a group of seventh graders down every year, um, this time of year, and we pull this Japanese knotweed out because like the garlic mustard that Mrs. S just showed you, it is invasive. Uh, and this stuff will grow everywhere if you don't get ahead of it. Uh, for those of you who may enjoy fishing, you'll notice both of these invasive plants all over the place along creek banks and in a floodplain like we have here at the Nature Trail. As we were walking along after our discussion about those two invasive plants, we turned around and found the remains of another dead deer. Um, Mr. Williams and I actually found this deer here last spring, I believe. Uh, it wasn't too long after it had been killed. There was still some hide left on it. Not sure how this deer met its end. Maybe it got hit by the road. 
and made its way in here heading toward water um, before it died right alongside the trail. All right. I wanted to take a minute and show you um, what's growing on this log. There are two uh, well, plants that are growing on here that you probably see all the time, but you don't know what they're called. This green one is a moss, and it's a very primitive plant. The tiny little leaves are on here, and their fruiting body, the one that makes the, um, the spores, uh, is it, aren't here right now. They sometimes will come out in the fall when it's nice and moist. Um, and then we have this, which a lot of people think might be paint, but it isn't paint. That is called lichens. And lichens is a combination of two organisms. It's a fungus and an algae that are working together to, uh, to grow and to live. The fungus collects um, the, the moisture and the algae uh, collects the sunlight to photosynthesize to make food. So this is a lichens and moss. And there are lots of different kinds of lichens and lots of different kinds of mosses. And as Mrs. S was talking about the moss and the lichens over there, I was just kind of looking out across this flat open area. Um, and there's a few different wildflowers flyer, that we mentioned already, some common blue violets, some spring beauties. And I was watching a big bumblebee, which is an insect, flying around, kind of tending to some of those flowers. And I also saw a few of the flies that Mrs. S mentioned earlier, um, checking out some of this skunk cabbage as well. So two different insects that we have down here at the Nature Trail. In first grade, every time we get to this part of the trail, I like to slow down and look in these piles of sticks and limbs um, that we have from some trees that fell on the trail and we had to cut up in recent years because they're a great place to find snakes. And if anybody in second grade is watching this video, uh, this is actually the spot where I caught the black rat snake from Mrs. Faust's class last year. Um, and if you look here, across this one limb, there's a snake skin. And it looks like this snake skin was probably shed from a big black rat snake as well. Very cool. Remember, you're always using those senses that Mrs. S talked about at the beginning when you're out here on the nature trail. You're taking in the sights, the sounds, the smells, and all of those things, utilizing all of your senses when you're here. You'll never know what you might see. Oh my goodness, this is one of my favorite spring flowers and I was hoping that we would find one. Um, it's a really, um, it's kind of hard to spot because the flower isn't a, the color of a flower that you usually think of. It's not red, it's not pink, it's not blue, it's green. So check it out. This is called so it's going to be a little hard to see. This is called a jack in the pulpit. Do you see the flower there? That's the, the, the part that gets pollinated. And then the, the petal is only one, flops over that. And so, yeah, that's a jack in the pulpit. Isn't that beautiful? Sometimes it, the inside will be maroon, but this one is green. What do we have here? What do you think, Mr. Ross? Looks to me like something was busy here. It does. It looks like they just took the bark off these trees. Look, this tree over here is all the way up. Oh, yeah. Just a point sticking up. What in the world would have done such a thing? Beaver? I think this was a beaver. You're right, Mrs. S. What would a beaver be doing in here? Hmm. Well, they do like to live they like to live around water, and they make a, a, a lodge so that they can um, raise their young but they, in the water, but they raise it up so that they're, they don't actually get wet while they're living in it, but they do like to make it so that it's hard for a predator to get in. So the entrance is underwater. So, I wonder if they were trying to build a dam. That must be what's going on here. What a cool thing to have. Yeah. living right here behind our school. Yeah. 
And the beaver is actually the second largest rodent in the world. No kidding. Yeah, they can get very, very big and they're very strong. They have strong jaws and strong teeth. Obviously strong enough to hack down a tree and drag these trees out into the water and build the lodges. Very cool. Oh my goodness. Look at What do you see? I see a feather. Oh yeah. Look at that. Yeah, that's a pretty that's a pretty big feather. That is a big feather. That's actually a turkey wing feather. That's awesome. Hmm. So wild turkey is a great big bird that we have here in the woods of Pennsylvania. Um, maybe some of you have heard these turkeys gobble early in the morning, this time of year especially. It's actually turkey hunting season right now in Pennsylvania too. We're right in the middle of the season. If any of you are hunters out there, you probably already know that. Looks to me like this wing feather probably came off maybe when a turkey was flying up to roost in one of these trees or flying out of the roost in the morning. Turkeys spend their nights actually up in the limbs of trees to avoid some of the predators that roam on the ground like fox and coyotes. Uh, now there are still some predators that will get them up in trees uh, like a great horned owl or even a bobcat has been known to climb up a tree and harass turkeys on the roost but that's one of their defense mechanisms. Very cool. And I think, is that another feather over there Mrs. Yeah. S? I, I just noticed that while you were talking. It's another big feather, but it doesn't have the same kind of stripes that yours has. I think this is a goose feather. And I was um, walking around the trail earlier today and I actually saw two geese in the water. So I wonder if while they were, you know, when I scared them, one of them dropped one of their wing feathers as well. One of the cool things about feathers that, um, that, not, that you might not know is that you see how it's broken here? And, you have used, and I'm sure you've seen birds doing what we call preening, which is when they uh, use their beaks to kind of comb through their feathers. What they're actually doing is zipping these feathers back together because they do kind of fall apart. They rip apart when they're flying. Did you see that? It's kind of zipped right back together. There's, there are two, there are little barbs on each side that will fit nicely together if you preen them just right. As we're here talking about these feathers, how light this feather is. It's pretty big, but it's so light. It's almost like it would float in the air. And bird bones and bird feathers, you know, the portions of the feathers that hold, um, that hold out are actually hollow and they're hollow so that they're very light because birds fly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I'm also looking over Mrs. S's shoulder here and kind of looking at our nature bingo sheet and I notice some things out there kind of on the island here in Roaring Creek and they're very smooth rocks. Oh, yeah. Hmm. I wonder why they're so smooth. I bet they get all bumped around in that water and it smooths them right off. Kind of like sea glass, if you've ever been to the beach and found a piece of sea glass. Yeah, so like Mrs. S was just explaining, over time, stones, rocks that are in creeks and rivers, they go through this process called erosion and they're moving and grinding into each other and the smooth flow of the water gives them that smooth and rounded shape. It's pretty cool. All right, first grade. So this concludes your nature walk with Mr. Roth and Mrs. S. I encourage all of you this summer and spring to get outside as much as you possibly can, whether you're fishing, riding your bike, hunting, or just going on a nature walk like we did here with you today. Uh, spend as much time outside as you can, especially during the beautiful seasons of spring and summer. You know, give the video games a rest for a little bit. You can even take your books outside and read on your porch. Uh, I can't encourage you enough to get outside and enjoy the beauty that nature has to offer, especially here where we're fortunate enough to live in central Pennsylvania. And don't forget, you can write in your nature journal of the stuff that you've seen here today, but also when you go out for your nature walks, just, you know, you go down to the creek and look under the rocks and see what's there. Just write it down, draw it, 
just so you can remember how wonderful nature is. So thank you for your time today.